Okay. Audio, so audio will be good? Yep. Okay. All right, because I got the mic on. Time, let me give you a cue. Well, good evening, guys. We're thankful that you're able to join us again uh, this week for another edition of our uh, online adult Bible study. Uh, I'm Pastor Wagner from Trinity Lutheran Church and School here in Lombard, Illinois, and uh, we're going to continue doing what we have been doing uh, for the last several weeks. We are going to take a look at the Bible passages that are going to be coming up in this coming Sunday's lectionary. And Old Testament and uh, Gospel reading. But first, as has been our way recently, we're going to look at a theme. We established a theme and then we see how these two texts kind of build in together around the theme. And so the theme that we're going to be looking at this week is that our salvation comes only through the one true God. Salvation through God alone. All right, so that's our theme, salvation through God alone. And you know what, let's actually be a little bit more accurate even than that. And we'll say salvation through Christ alone. Okay, salvation through Christ alone. So we will go ahead and get started. Um... We'll have Sam go ahead and post up our Old Testament text from Isaiah 44, verses 6 through 8, which I will read momentarily. And here it is. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. I have, not told you, have I not told you from old and declared it, and you are my witnesses? Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. Okay, so let's tear into that one. Okay, the first thing, and again, remember our theme. You can really see how this is brought out here in our theme, in our Isaiah text, that it's about Jesus alone. Okay, Jesus alone is what we're talking about here. So the first thing to look at is that in verse 6 he calls himself the king of Israel. The king of Israel. Oh, so, so right off the bat, God is, God is making the case and the statement and the assertion that he's the head he's the ruler king so he's the boss there's no authority higher than him anywhere in the universe it is all about him he is um he's not just some regular old god he's the big guy he's the king and then you notice also in verse six he talks about his redeemer the lord of hosts
Now that's important because not only, of course, is this a reference to the coming Messiah, which would end up being Jesus, but notice the fact that he calls Jesus a redeemer. Okay, that is to say that God is a God who is actually a savior. He actually does something for his people as opposed to just some mere idol that is claiming to be God. So he's not only claiming to be the king of all, but he's actually going to do something, redeem his people, that will give him that title justly. All right. Okay, we got a few people in already. Good to see all of you guys. Now, the next thing, he's established the fact that he's the boss. He's established the fact that he can be called the boss because he's going to do something to save the world. Then he makes this statement that you are probably familiar with. I am the first and the last. All right, now, first off, the I am, uh, if you're familiar with, um, you know, your Old Testament history, you know that the phrase I am is, uh, that's what God says his name is. Uh, in, in Exodus, uh, when Moses was asking him, well, if the people want to know what your name is, what should I tell them? And God said, tell them, I am the great I am. So I am the name of God. And the first and the last, you might have heard it in some translations quoted as the, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Um, no matter how you slice it, the claim that he is the first and the last, well, the, that he is the first, he's saying he was the creator, no one came before him, it was him who put all of this into motion. Now, you got to be something special if you're going to be the creator of the universe. And so the fact that he is the first, he is pointing that out. And he is the last. Which is to say that when all the cards have been played, and here we are on the last day, and it's judgment day, and um, everything's going to play out the way it's going to play out, he's going to be the one in charge on the last day. So he was in charge on the first day. He was in charge on the last day. Okay, so again, he's king. He's the redeemer. And he's in, been in charge from the beginning. And he's going to be in charge till the very end of the age. So he's really hammering home this idea of him alone. And alone is the key word here because we, we every week you get some sort of lesson about salvation coming through Jesus, but the point this week is it's Jesus alone. He's the king, he's the redeemer, the first, the last, the alpha, the omega. Okay, Barb, you are a bright spot in my day. Thank you for continuing the pre... Barbara, you are so kind and sweet. Thank you for the kind... Uh, Barb gets the first bell of the day because on this show... Flattery will get you everywhere. Thank you, Barb. Um, now, next in the lesson. Okay, he says, uh, where is it? I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. Okay, so again, here we are with this business of him alone. Okay, so in other words, he's saying, he's not saying that there's a group of gods and I'm the best one of them. He's not saying, you know, I won the God championship this year. Look at my, me and my Super Bowl trophy. He's not claiming to be the best of a group. Rather, he's claiming to be the only one. So here we are again with this alone theme that we're hammering home. He is the only God that there is. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Who is like me? 
So now he's saying, okay, I've made this assertion that I'm the, uh, the only one we got here. If anyone wants to challenge that assertion, by all means, please come forth, God is saying. Who is like me? Well, it's a rhetorical question, of course. The intended answer is nobody. All right. Let's see. No questions yet. Just the nice comment, Barb schmoozing the pastor, which worked. Um, and then he transitions talking about who is like me, let him proclaim it, let him declare it, said it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Since I appointed an ancient people. Okay, again, you got to be pretty big time stuff to actually create a universe with people in it. And so this is just continuing this uh, message, this declaration of God about himself through the mouth of Isaiah. I mean, nobody I know can create a group of people. Okay, so if you're going to create a group of ancient people you got to be special, and so here is the idea, God alone, God alone. All right, next, let them declare what is to come. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. So, God is the ruler, the king, the redeemer, the first and the last, and the only, to the extent that not only did he appoint ancient people, God actually knows the future. Hi, Trudy, how are you? Thank you so, thank you for watching. Don't thank me, thank yourself for joining us. I really appreciate it. Um, let them, God knows the future. God not only is the God of history and is the God of the past, he also is the God of the future. He has written the future. He has ordained the future. He knows what's going to happen. So what he's saying here is, okay, if any of you other guys want to step up here and claim to be God like me, tell me what's going to happen in the future. Give me next year's Super Bowl champion. Well, if we have a Super Bowl with COVID-19, give me some, uh, give me next week's lottery numbers in Iowa or something. No one knows the future but God. And so he's um, yet another way that it's him alone because no one else knows what is going to happen. All right, now next. Ah, yes, he finishes up. In verse 8, fear not, nor be afraid. Fear not. Now think about what God is saying here. Fear not. Okay, he's the king. He's the ultimate. He's the redeemer. The, the world, the fate of the world rests in his hands. He's the beginning. He's the end. There's nobody else. He appointed an ancient people, he made everything that there is. He knows the future. So God can like literally do anything. Well, now the question becomes, what do we deserve from God? What do we deserve from God? Well, because of our sin, because of our imperfection, we deserve to be zapped into dust. And he absolutely has the power to do that right? But like he said earlier, he's not going to use his power to condemn us. He's going to use his power to save us. There's our theme. He's going to use his power to save us. So he tells you, fear not. There's no reason to be afraid. Yes, I have the ability to zap you back into pixie dust, but I'm not going to do that because I love you. Rather, I'm going to send a savior who is going to redeem you. Jeff, you're late, my friend. You must manage your time better. No, I'm kidding, of course. Thank you for joining us, sir. Um, there's no reason to be afraid of God. Because you are not an enemy of God. 
you are his beloved child, so there is no reason to be afraid. And lastly, the closing statement there, is there a God besides me? Of course, again, more rhetorical questions. Is there a God beside me? There is no rock. I know not any. I know not any. <clears throat> God, again, is declaring himself to be the only God. I don't know of anybody else who can do all this stuff. I certainly don't know of anybody who can save you. Salvation comes to us through Christ alone. The idea of Christ alone is going to be the big theme in the text this coming Sunday. Okay, so that gets us through... Our uh, Old Testament lesson from Isaiah 44. I saw a bleep that my good friend and seminary classmate, Emil Werner, has joined us. Emil, if you are still with us, say hi. It would be good to see you again, my good, my good man. Jeff, your first buzzer. You know what? Keep acting up. You might get a few more. <laughs> okay. So now, you, you clearly, the Isaiah text is all over this theme. But let's take a look at the Matthew text, and let's see how it also ties in from Matthew 13. Now this, again, is going to sound a little bit familiar to you because we looked at it, oh, a month, month and a half ago. Hello, Emil. Thank you for being with us, my good man. We got baseball coming up next week, buddy. Go Astros. Um... We looked at Matthew 13 about a month and a half ago, but we looked at it back then from an evangelism point of view. Today, same parable, similar to what we looked at last week. Last week, we looked at the parable of the sower because that was the gospel lesson for last Sunday. This coming week, we're looking at the parable of the weeds. The parable of the weeds and the wheat. And so let's see how this ties in with our theme of salvation through Christ alone. Go Braves. Uh, we're going to have to tell you. You know, you guys there in Atlanta, y'all change stadiums more than I change underwear out there. My goodness. Okay, so let's go ahead and have Sam put up uh, the Parable of the Weeds, verses 24 through 30. And I will read it now. So here you go. Jesus put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seeds in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds amongst the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seeds in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you'll root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Okay, the parable of the weeds. Sue, running late, traffic, buzzer for you, lady. You must be here on time. This is not. This is the second time I've had to buzz somebody. I, I thought the batteries in my buzzers were not going to work because you guys had been behaving so well. Phyllis, Phyllis, thank you for joining us, dear. It's good to see you, hon. We appreciate it. No, of course, Sue, I'm just yanking your chain. One day past a big milestone birthday for Sue. Okay, so what the parable itself is rather self-explanatory in terms of in terms of understanding what he's saying from a, a, an agricultural perspective. So let's do that first. Okay, so Jesus puts another parable before them. Now we've talked recently because there's been a lot of parables that Jesus has been telling in the gospel lessons. And of course, a parable, again, is a story that is intended to be used as an illustration, a metaphor, 
to teach some sort of theological truth. And again, Jesus teaching parables about farming is going to resonate, will resonate with his hearers, because in this day and age and culture, farming was the way everybody made a living. And so if you're going to tell a story about farming to a bunch of farmers, they're probably going to get what you're trying to get them to understand. Okay, so we start into the parable. He says, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to kingdom of heaven compared. Compared. Okay, the fact that there's a comparison is yet another overt um, sign that we're having a parable here. Now, I, I suppose I haven't mentioned this in, in these recent studies, but it's, it's a good thing to mention, and that is that there's a lot of debate about how do you interpret the Bible? Because, make no mistake about it, the Bible can be twisted and contorted to, uh, you can make it say pretty much anything you want it to say if you get creative enough. And many folks do just that. Well, as a Missouri Synod Lutheran, we believe that the Bible is to be taken literally. Uh, the fancy seminary term that I know Emil will remember is the historical grammatical method of scripture interpretation. That's a fancy term to make you think that I'm smart, but what it basically means is you take it at face value. Um, Adam and Eve were actual historical characters. A flood literally happened. Jesus actually was a man who walked the earth as opposed to just allegorizing everything in Scripture. So when you're a Missouri Synod Lutheran and you're reading the Bible, you're supposed to take it at face value as actual historical fact. Well, of course, there are some portions of the Bible that aren't to be taken literally, namely parables, um, prophecies. A lot of Old Testament prophecies, uh, of course, are not to be taken literal. The whole entire book of Revelation is not to be taken literal. Um, but see, as a Missouri Synod Lutheran, we don't switch the channel between um, literal, 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 oh, figurative, 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 we don't do that um, subjectively. Scripture tells us when we're going to switch from literal interpretation to figurative and back. And so when you see the word parable in the text, that should be your clue to, oh, we're changing channels. We're no longer taking this section literally as written. Now it's a metaphor. And so we're going to interpret it accordingly until the end of this section then we go back to our literal, literal, literal interpretation. So the fact that Jesus says this, the text says this is a parable, and Jesus says the kingdom of heaven can be compared to, we are actually being given permission by the text and by Jesus himself to switch off our literal interpretation and go to figurative. Okay, Lori has written me, and Lori says... Some scholars argue that the Hebrew tradition of Midrash said a parable will only have one point, but when I read the Bible, it seems like God has packed them richly with many things to discern and learn from. What do you think about this? I think, Lori, you are correct, and I found this out. I found this out the hard way um, back in seminary. Uh, I think Emil might have been in the class with me, who's online. Um, in the winter quarter of 2006, I no, the spring of 2006, I took my first preaching class. And so I'm sitting in there with Reverend uh, Professor Newfer, and he's telling us the basics of how to construct a sermon, how to think in law gospel terms. And so we're going through in our midterm grade after you know the first half of the class is nothing but lecture now we're going to go get into the intimidating pulpit up in kramer chapel on on campus at, at the salmon fort wayne and you're going to preach a sermon based on the basics that you've been given so far and you'll be evaluated that's your midterm grade right well i was distraught 
because we were all given the same text to preach. And Professor Newfer says that uh, you're going to preach them in alphabetical order. You know, the, the A's and B's are preaching on this day, then the C's, D's, and E's on this day. Well, I'm a W. I'm at the end. And so I'm like, well, man, there's 17 people in this class. How many possible sermons can you get from the same text? By the time I'm going to get in the pulpit, everybody's going to said, I already said what I want to say, my sermon will be stolen, and they're going to think that I'm just piggybacking off of what they preached. My sermon will be taken. Well... I wrote the sermon, and you heard 17 very, very different sermons, very different takes on the same text. And so this gives credence to what Lori is saying, that, um, you know, when it, comes to, when it comes to God's truth, I mean, there's truth and there's error. I mean, that's pretty black and white, but the application of it in real-life situations, it's kind of like a diamond. You twist it, and there's so many facets to it to the same text, the same idea that uh, there can be endless applications depending on uh, what you want to talk about. So yes, Lori, I agree. Parables, uh, parables are fun to me. The whole key to getting a parable, I've said this before, I'll probably say it again here later on in this lesson, and that is the key to understanding a parable is you got to crack the code. There's always a code to a parable and if you don't have the pieces of the puzzle right, when you start putting them together, it's not going to make any sense. But as long as you've got the code accurate, then you're going to get what God is trying to tell you. Okay, good stuff. Okay, so Jesus is telling us a parable. What's he saying? Okay, so the man, there is a man who sowed good seed in a field. Seems pretty simple and basic, right? Well... It is, but one thing you ought to keep in mind as you uh, break this down in your head is that this is a farmer. This is how he makes his living. His livelihood and the livelihood of his family, <coughs> excuse me, is completely dependent on him developing a high yield, a healthy crop. So he's not out there like last week we saw the uh, sower of the seeds willy-nilly throwing them every which way. Well, Jesus had a different message last week. This week, this guy is only planning on good fertile soil because his family's ability to eat literally depends on him doing a good job. So everything for him is writing on the fact that this turns out okay. So he's sowing good seeds in his field because this is what he does and this is what he must do. But... An enemy came and sowed weeds amongst the wheat. So clearly this is a deliberate attempt of sabotage because the enemy is trying to destroy the good that the farmer I need to go back to spelling. Destroy. The farmer, the farmer produced something that's good. The enemy is trying to destroy it. Now keep that in mind because, uh, you know, you're going to see that play out here in a little bit. So when everything started to grow up, you know, you had wheat. But you also had weeds. That's a problem. Um, clearly, I mean, this is what you would expect when you sow both, both are going to grow, but weeds are the farmer's mortal enemy because as you probably know, uh, weeds, they have really deep roots. They're very stingy. They're very selfish. They, um, they hog up the, um, they hog up the soil. They try to choke out the weeds of, or they try to choke out the roots of the good plants. And so the 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 fact that the fact that uh, I mean the fact that weeds were sown into the soil, it wasn't just a 
oh, I'm going to play a little joke on you. Weeds are very, very destructive when you put them side by side with good plants. All right, Lori writes, so not being a real garden type, aren't weeds a normal part of gardening and some that a good gardener deals with on a regular basis but the master said an enemy did this so is this just an acknowledgement that sin in the world is sin in the world or something more lori ever the deep thinker um i i think i might have just answered that in my little rant that i went on before i read your your note um weeds are a part of everyday gardening but that's because we are in a sinful fallen world. Weeds are destructive uh, to crops and to gardens. <clears throat> they are destructive. And so the fact that an enemy did this, he was trying to destroy a good crop. Barb. So why wouldn't it be better to remove the bad weeds before they could possibly overgrow? Ah, Barb, that question is coming up to be answered very shortly. Hold that thought. Thank you for, for writing in. Okay, so you've got both weeds and wheat, and that's a bad thing for the guy because the wheats are destructive to actual plants. The workers are confused. How did this happen? Didn't you sow good seed? Why in the world... Uh, hold on. Didn't you sow good seed? How in the world did this happen? What's wrong? Didn't you sow good seed? How in the world are there weeds everywhere? So they're they're confused because they know that good seed was supposedly sown. They're at a loss. Well, the farmer knows what happened. He said an enemy has done this. And again, you know, before you guys get uh, too far off in the weeds, see what I did there? Pun intended. Before you get too far off in the weeds trying to wrestle with this in your mind, um, the point that is helpful to keep in your head is that in this analogy, weeds destroy. You know what? That was a really bad joke on my part. Sorry about that. Um, weeds destroy. And so keep it simple. Weeds destroy. That'll help you sift through all this. So an enemy was trying to, um, trying to sift through and trying to ruin it. Let's see. Well, Lori, I'm glad somebody appreciates my horrible sense of humor. Okay. So, to ask Barb Wozniak uh, in a response to her point, the workers say, should we just go out and pull out the weeds? Should we go pull the weeds out? Let's get them out of the way now. I mean... You know, let's not have them ruin the crop. The crop's going to have a hard time growing. It's going to affect things. Let's just pull them out now, like, like Barb said to do. <clears throat> well, the farmer said, no, because when you pull up the weeds, you might root up some wheat with them. So, you know, Barb, if you're doing some gardening in your garden and you got a whole bunch of weeds and you start pulling them up, uh, you know, it, it might mess because the, the, the roots are going to get all intertangled, intertwined, right? And so when you start pulling weeds, there's a chance you're going to pull roots up of the good plants that you want to keep. Now... When you're gardening, you may or may not make the decision to pull some weeds anyways. I mean, if you've got a whole bunch of, uh, of, of plants and, you know, you, you're like, well, okay, if I sacrifice a plant or two, it'll be worth it to get rid of these weeds, right? Well, the farmer, the point here, the, big, the bigger theological point that's going to be applied here in a minute is the fact that the farmer... The farmer was not willing to risk one single stalk of wheat, not one grain. The wheat was so valuable, the wheat was so valuable to the farmer 
that he's like, no, nah, let's just wait because it's we could get all these weeds out of here, but we might lose one or two. And some will say, well, what's the big deal about losing one or two? Well, to the farmer, it was a big deal. Wasn't willing to risk literally nothing. Some of us are refined by the fire. Well, that's coming up too, isn't it? They didn't have Roundup in these days, Emil. Thank you. Exactly. Um, you know, that's good stuff. You hook it up to your garden hose. You spray it all over. It, it causes a little bit of a stink in the backyard, but the weeds die. The grass doesn't. In these days, again, you know, this was about two or three years before the Ace Hardware opened in Jerusalem, so they didn't have Roundup available to them. Um... So you're left with the decision to pull them out by hand, and in doing so, you risk damaging the crop, and the farmer wasn't willing to run that risk. So he said, no, let's let it go. And when the day comes to, uh, uh, to harvest everything at harvest time, we're going to separate the weeds from the wheat. And at that time, after growing them together, the weeds will be burned. Because... In this story, the weeds have no value whatsoever, at least to the farmer, and they don't have any redeeming qualities anyways. So they're going to just get thrown into the fire, but the wheat is going to go to the barn. The wheat has immense value to this farmer. As you saw, he wasn't willing to risk it. And so once harvest time comes through, they're able to pull it all out of the ground. They're able to separate it. Then the wheat will be taken care of. They're going to get the VIP treatment. They're going to be stored in the safety of a barn because they have immense value. Okay, so that is the parable itself. The roundup is God's promise and words to it. You know what? Um, I like it, Sue. I like, I like where your head is. I like where your head is. Okay. Um, now, you might be saying after you, you know, you, you heard this parable, what in the world is Jesus talking about? We know there's a message. Um, let's get the code here. What's the code? Let's crack the code so we can figure out what the parable actually means. So I'll have Sam go ahead and put up the remaining part, which is, what is that, Sam? Verses 30, what the whole... Uh, 36 through 43, we'll have Sam put those graphics up. I'll make some room so we can break it down, and I'll read it for you. Okay, so 36 through 43. Then Jesus left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. Jesus answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed are the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are angels. So just as the weeds are gathered and burned with the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace and in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father he who has ears let him hear thank you for that Sam okay now this is this is a good parable to break down because you don't have to figure out the code Jesus just gave the whole thing to you and that's going to make it quite a bit easier. Okay, now notice something. Before we start breaking down the parable, though, the apostles, the, the, the 12 apostles here, or his disciples, they had no idea what Jesus was trying to tell them when he told this parable. They were completely clueless. So after everybody goes home, they're inside settling in for dinner. They're like, hey, man, explain this to us. We don't know what you're talking about. Now, that's helpful. 
because the the disciples didn't get what Jesus was saying. Understand, these are Jesus' hand-picked disciples. If anyone should have been uh, all understanding, <clears throat> you would have thought, who are his men and why were they sleeping? Okay, well, Jeff, thank you. Um, the men... I, as to why they were sleeping, I think running with the analogy, it was simply late at night. Um, the men were his workers, and according to Jesus' explanation, which we'll get to as we break it down in a minute, um, he's going to, uh, those were his angels. Now, Sam, on the screen right now is the previous text, correct? We're going to switch that over? Thank you, I appreciate it. Sandy. Deep theological comment. Roundup kills all vegetation. Weed be gone kills weeds, not the grass. Aha! See, she got us on a technicality. Sandy knows her gardening stuff much better than than I do. And apparently Emil. Thank you, Sam. Um, okay. Now the point here is, okay, you would have thought that Jesus' hand-picked disciples would understand what he's talking about, but guess what? They didn't. And there is no shortage of examples all throughout the Gospels that they didn't get it. Which means they ain't no different from you and I. Okay? When you're reading Scripture and you don't understand what it is that you are reading, do what they did. Go to Ask him for knowledge. Ask him for wisdom. And he's going to give it to you. When they asked Jesus, hey, we don't know what you're talking about. He didn't shame them. He didn't jump down their kitchen. Guys, you guys are so dull. What do you how do you not get this? This is he didn't get on to him at all. He lovingly explained the meaning of the text because he wants them to get it. He wants them to understand it. And he wants you to understand it. And more importantly, understanding of God, his word, Jesus, his ways, comes by the power of the Holy Spirit working through this word. So you ask Jesus for that understanding through the Holy Spirit, you're going to get it. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. So if you're ever wrestling with scripture, don't beat yourself up. The disciples didn't get it either. Just go to God and go to Jesus and pray. He'll give you understanding. Okay. So... Jesus breaks down the text, so the sower is the Son of Man. In other words, Jesus. Now remember, last week the sower was me and you and all Christians sowing the seed. But again, this is a, a different parable, slightly different message than we had last week. So the sower is Jesus... And again, you can see how this ties into our theme of salvation through Jesus alone. There's only one sower. Jesus alone. There is nobody else that's going to sow life outside of him. So Christ alone, our theme for this coming Sunday. The field is the world. Field is the world. So... Jesus is showing himself to be not only a creator, but he's also a caretaker. He takes care of things. He didn't make you and then sent you off and wish you well and hope you survive. No, he's taking care of you every step of the way, every second of your life, just like he cares for his world. He didn't just make it and hands off and good luck with it. That's not how God works. The good seed, he says, is the sons of the kingdom. That is believers. That is his children. That is you. In this parable, you were the seeds that ended up becoming wheat. Okay, so make that connection. You are the wheat. Important in understanding this. 
The weeds are the sons of the evil one. The weeds are the world, uh, unbelievers, uh, again, and, and so that is to say that the unbelievers are the destructive weeds. It also would stand to reason that the enemy that did this is Satan. And look at what, you know, the greater point that this says, okay? We says that the farmer in the parable went to great pains. The farmer went to great pains to try to create something that's good. Because in the parable, his livelihood depended on it. This is what God does. What God creates, he creates to always be good, to be holy, to be righteous. The enemy wanted to destroy that. So in the same way, the mission statement of the devil is to literally try to destroy every good thing that God has created, including you your happiness, and your faith in Jesus. That is what the devil is ultimately about, wrecking and ruining your earthly life, or attempting to, and reckoning and ruin, ruining your eternal life, or attempting to. Now, you know, we've talked many, many times about how God is not only a creator and, and a provider, he's also a protector, uh, the devil is sitting here feverishly flaming, shooting flaming arrows, as the Bible talks about. Imagine, you know, his attempts to ruin and to cause havoc and to destroy and to kill and to cause pain, whatever that, however that may manifest it in your world, in your life. He's sitting here firing 50,000 arrows a second out of you, or at you. 50,000 a second don't actually get through to you, though. Um, a few do, and we've talked about that before. Uh, the few flaming arrows that get through, get through only because God allows them, and there's a reason for it, and we, we've, we've had that discussion. But the fact is that the devil is trying to ruin you every second of your life. Uh, if you went out and you drove anywhere today, whether you drove 100 miles or 100 feet... The devil attempted to see to it that you were part of a fiery, fatal car crash. If you're on here, it obviously didn't happen because God protected you. Every day of your life, every second of your life that goes by, that something really, really, really bad doesn't happen, you got that second free from complete and utter destruction only because God is sitting there blocking those flaming arrows. Okay? So the devil can try to destroy, and he will, constantly, but fighting the devil is not your fight, that's God's fight, and he is your equipper, he is your protector, and again, Jesus alone fights that fight for you. Okay, so the devil destroys, and the harvest is judgment day. So the day where they, okay, they, they kind of go ahead and pull everything up. And we do the big separation of the weeds and the wheat. That is reflective of Judgment Day. Now, as you know, Scripture has taught over and over that uh, this world is going to continue on until Jesus comes back, because he promised he's going to come back. That is the... Um, that's the, 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 the big promise he made when he ascended into heaven in Acts chapter 1. He's, I shall return, he says. And when he does, that is when sin will be uh, defeated once and for all, uh, locked away, banished in hell, won't ever bother God or his people or his kingdom ever again. And so that day when that happens, that's reflective of this harvest. Now again... Look at what this parable says. 
I said you were representative of the, or the wheat is representative of you. And the farmer represents God. Remember how much, how valuable the wheat was to the farmer? Now, Barb Wozniak, this is where your question gets answered uh, from earlier. The farmer wouldn't pull the wheat because he loved the wheat so much he wouldn't risk one single stalk. So look at the parable. God loves you so much that he will not endanger you or risk you in any way. So the love and the value that the farmer had for the wheat is reflective of the love and the value that God has for you. Important point in the passage. And then, of course, the reapers are the angels. This is uh, to, to Jeff's question a little bit ago. The uh, the workers of the um, the workers in the field are um, representative of the angels, and uh, the angels are going to serve Jesus now and on Judgment Day in the same way the reapers served the farmer during the whole planting and growing season, and then the actual harvest. All right, now. Here's where we get to the nitty-gritty, and you see how Matthew connects to our theme today of salvation through Christ alone. Okay, Jesus says that just like the weeds were gathered and burned, it's going to be that way at the end of the age. That is to say that the unbelievers are going to meet the same fate. And that's a very unpleasant thought. God talks about the elimination or the elimination of sin and the how was it actually phrased? Um, they will gather out of His kingdom all causes of sin, all lawbreakers, and throw them in the fiery furnace. And in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So just like the weeds were burned because they have no value to the farmer, where the wheat has infinite value to the farmer. The unbelievers are going to be burned on Judgment Day. In other words, locked into the very unpleasant place to think about known as hell. Um, eternal fire. And he says in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You hear that a lot uh, when Jesus, um, Jesus talks. Let's see, gnashing of teeth. Okay, that is to say that hell is not a pleasant place. It's not going to be a place where its inhabitants are going to be sitting around, kind of bored. Oh, this stinks. I'm not very happy. It is a place of eternal torment and pain. There's nothing pleasant about fire. And so Jesus is giving, on one hand, a warning that the unbelievers will end up with the same fate that the weeds, but then he says that the righteous will shine like the sun. The righteous will shine like the sun. Remember how well taken care of the wheat were. They were gathered up. They were put in the safety and security of the farmer's barn. Well, the righteous are going to be gathered up in the kingdom of heaven. Now, this business about shining like the sun. Best way to connect that is the fact that Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the light that provides the eternal light that will shine forever and ever and ever in kingdom within the kingdom of heaven without end. Jesus is the light. And so the righteous meet a very, very, very different fate than the unrighteous and the unbelievers, just in the same way that the weeds made a different fate of the wheat. Okay, now let's put this together and let's talk about Scott. This can be interpreted as once saved, always saved, weeds, wheat. Actually, um, 
it can and let's break that down in a minute because that's not exactly what it's saying but i could see where that train of thought would be applicable uh we're gonna set that aside uh i am barb i'm so happy that barbara has saved every single stock of believers we're gonna get back to that in a second scott but uh, to put the pieces of the puzzle together and i don't know maybe this will help maybe this will help with, with scott's comment the million dollar question for you to wrestle with is when judgment day comes are you going to be viewed as weeds and treated accordingly or are you going to be viewed as wheat and treated accordingly? Well, here's where the theme of Christ alone comes into play. Because it says, the text says, sin is given the boot. Sin is all lawbreakers thrown into the fiery furnace. And the righteous are going to be the ones that get to shine like the sun. Well, if I'm totally honest with myself, I'm a lawbreaker and I'm a sinner. I'm not righteous by any stretch of the imagination, no matter how you might define it. So what's going to await me? Well, this is the big switch because when you are judged on Judgment Day, because of Jesus' death and resurrection for you, because of your faith in the promise that is attached to his death and resurrection for you, namely that those who believe that the death and resurrection of Jesus was full atonement for all sins of all the world, those who believe that by the power of the Holy Spirit get the whole, get the sins of forgiveness. Get the sins of forgiveness. And so through forgiveness, one on the cross, now everyone like me who deserves the weeping and the gnashing of teeth, we get to hang out in the, the, the shining of the sun because though the reality of our sin is apparent to us, God sees you through the, righteous, the lens of the righteousness of Jesus through the cross in which all of your sins are forgiven. So when you stand before God in judgment day, um, you will be declared righteous, even though you and I aren't, and even though we don't deserve it, we will be declared righteous. Phyllis, two things about weeds. Christ can turn a weed seed into a wheat through forgiveness. He did for, well, he did it for all of us, actually, Phyllis. I mean, and maybe this is where we can start to unravel Scott's question, is that technically speaking, by nature, all of us were, were conceived as weeds, but we got it changed. We were changed because of forgiveness. And God often uses the weeds to make hearts ready for the Holy Spirit. This might be what Scott is thinking about. Well, I can see where Scott is going with this. Because if you follow it all the way, there's two sides. And there isn't any in between, at least in the example as given. And so if you take that too far... It could, and, and actually, Scott, I have seen this used to justify once saved, always saved, as a matter of fact. So how do we as a Lutheran respond to that very valid and legitimate concern? Well, the point of the parable, especially in context with um, the Isaiah text, the point here is that Jesus alone makes sure that you are wheat instead of weeds. You were weeds, now you're a wheat. And that happened because of forgiveness. Um, in a vacuum, the idea that this is once saved, always saved is a very valid interpretation. The problem is when you start putting this before dozens of other passages that smash um, once saved, always saved to pieces. I mean, there's plenty of passages that, that go against the idea of once saved, always saved. And this is why we do not interpret Scripture in a vacuum. You do not interpret a parable or any verse in light of itself, but rather in light of the entirety of the whole book. And so it is a fair 
interpretation of once saved always saved if you take this text in a vacuum but we don't take text in a vacuum um, might be a decent Bible study topic it's something that I could do if that's something you guys want to tear into at some point let me know write me um, oh no Phyllis we know you don't mean that he did it for you alone you you were acknowledging that he did it for you like he's done it for everybody else um, so yes I, I guess that's my answer Scott is that this text isn't to be taken in a vacuum it's to be taken in in light of all of the other many passages that shoot down that idea by the way if you're if you're if you're watching this and you're like well what the heck is once saved always saved it is an idea in many American uh, Christian denominations today that you cannot fall from grace now this might be a gasp moment to many of you that are watching this and uh, you start getting the pitchforks and getting angry at me hear me out uh, let me finish um, it is theologically possible that one can in fact fall from grace but you know what I'm gonna let Emil answer this because he's a better pastor than me I think you have to remember last week's parable the weeds can choke out the good seed yes Jesus warns us that there will be always be weeds, but we are rooted in Christ, the good soil. I, you know what? I like his answer better than mine. Why don't you, Emil, come up from Arkansas and, and co-host this show with me on a weekly basis. We'll talk about travel expenses. Give me a call. Um, the point, the greater point is that you have been made a wheat into good soil by the, yeah, I got to give Emil a, a bell, uh, and me a buzz. The greater point is that uh, you have been made so by Christ. Now, if you really want to dig into the once saved, always saved, it is theologically possible to fall from grace because the devil is, is steadily trying to destroy it. He's trying to destroy your faith. The shield that defends you, defends you against that happening is word and sacrament ministry because in word and sacrament ministry, you encounter Jesus and it is Jesus that keeps your faith alive, thwarting the efforts of the devil. Um, let's see. I know plenty about weeds. Well, I mean, you guys down there in Arkansas, you know, that's all y'all got down there. All right, I don't know if I've satisfactorily addressed any of this, but it is after time. Uh, if you would like an in a deeper dive into um, once saved, always saved, and this idea of falling from grace and how is it possible but not likely as long as not 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 possible as long as Christ is driving the car uh, write me I'll put it together but let's close with tying all of this together the world and everything in it was created not by a committee of gods but by the one true God the triune God is the one true God and there is no other God that is equal to him or even in existence and this almighty, and here's the point, this almighty, all-powerful God of ours has used his omnipotent power not for our deserved condemnation, heaven is your future because forgiveness comes through Jesus, in Jesus alone. Okay. Thanks again for joining us this week. Uh, we will close <clears throat> with the praying of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, once again, we thank you for joining us. Uh, we invite you out there to join us for worship. We live stream our worship services every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Central Time, originating from our sanctuary here at Trinity Lutheran in Lombard, Illinois. And I come back every Thursday evening at 6 p.m. Central Time for a Bible study. I typically look at the Old 
Testament and the Gospel lesson for the coming Sunday, so that when you're in church and you're listening to your pastor preach, uh, you got a little bit of a, got the juices flowing a little bit. And so uh, that's what we try to do here. So again, I thank you very much for watching. I look forward to seeing you um, in church here if you're local in Lombard, and I thank you.